The work we did, which was primarily focused on hate speech, did work at a slightly higher level, although with those roots in the community. So we worked in Iraq and Pakistan and Myanmar, although we had to leave Myanmar very tragically after the coup because we couldn't continue working on hate speech there. And we wanted to understand hate speech. We wanted to understand how hate speech impacted on individuals and how it impacted on their poverty or their ability to lift themselves out of poverty. And it was very interesting how hate speech did interfere. I mean, at a very basic level on, with face-to-face -face hate speech, so things that were said or signs put up said, X not welcome in this shop. Or people who were trading together, doing business, um, contracting together, the minority communities always knew that they were vulnerable to an allegation of blasphemy or some kind of other hate speech directed at them by the majority community, which could really undermine any possibility of them doing business or starting a business or even disputes about land or disputes, even nurses, even in hospitals, hate speech has interfered with people's ability to go about their normal daily working life. So we really wanted to understand this, and we took a slightly different approach because we looked at hate speech across a number of communities, both in Iraq and then in Pakistan after we left Myanmar. And we saw how complex how it was, how mobile and flexible it was, how it shifted in response to external events, and how difficult it was to kind of put your finger on it because it kept, it was a bit like mercury, kept kind of getting away from us or from the people we were working with who were who were trying to understand it. But also we wanted to understand, can something be done about hate speech? And we worked with these positive messaging campaigns whereby um, in Iraq, journalists were trained to think about the language they were using in their articles. And a lot of this hate speech, people become very inured to it. It becomes a very common way of speaking and people just kind of accept it more or less as normality even though when you look at the psychosocial impact on religious minority communities, it's incredibly damaging to have these terms used about you day in, day out. So just having these positive messages was a huge um, morale booster for the minority community members, women and men, children, but also it resulted in different policy decisions. So clinics that had remained closed for five years serving the Kakai community in Iraq were, were suddenly staffed again. And this was during COVID, so having access to a clinic was pretty important at that particular moment. Um, other things happened. So in, in Pakistan, we had youth groups who were trained on what hate speech was and how they could counter it. And they then set about uh, doing stuff in their colleges and their universities, educating another um, set of students about this phenomenon and how it can actually be tackled. And again, using the youth, that was a really positive, a positive way forward. Um, we did some legal cases just to take us off hate speech. In, in Pakistan, um, it's quite common for jobs for the lowest menial workers to be advertised as only non-Muslims need apply or only Christians need apply. It's directly discriminatory against every UN commitment that Pakistan has made and, and our partners brought a legal case on that point. We're still waiting for the Supreme Court to rule on it, but in the meantime, the authorities have actually responded and a number of provinces have said this is not acceptable, we have to stop doing this. Still a few of those adverts are slipping through, but they're, they're far fewer than they were, so that's a really positive achievement in the kind of long term in terms of sustaining um, a new way forward for some of those very, very marginalised communities. Um, so we eventually brought all our experiences together in this toolkit, which is available online for anybody who wants to think about how they can tackle hate speech if they're impacted by it. It is very focused on religious minorities, but it's also relevant to others. So if you're working with communities, it literally takes the words of people in Myanmar, in, in, in Iraq or in Pakistan, it tells you how they did it, how anyone in many world contexts, which are quite difficult to work in, can do something similar. Um, other things we produce, I'll just share with you, um, it's very useful, everyone talks about hate speech, but what, what are the terms that are actually offensive? This is not available online, so when we deliberately didn't put it online because we were worried that people who wanted to misuse it would access it there. But if you're a diplomat turning up to start your work in Islamabad, you know, you might hopefully get given one of these and you'll know that when somebody says 
this word, you shouldn't repeat it. it you know, this is not a word that, as a, as a diplomat, you should be using. Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of the learning, I mean, we we struggled with a lot of social and political change in both countries, uh, particularly Iraq. So the kind of legal case success we had in Pakistan, we probably couldn't have in Iraq because things weren't functioning and there was a lot of political turmoil across the period we were working in. So that was very challenging. And also we were lucky enough in Creed that the FCDO said to us, you don't have to put the UK flag on this. Um, and that was incredibly important for us because the way that things are taken in Iraq and Pakistan and Myanmar in terms of being Western driven or externally driven would have been really undermining of our efforts and it would have made us much less likely to succeed to the extent that we did. So that was, that was particularly, particularly helpful for us. Um, in terms of the US government, um, keep focusing on, on religion, religion and conflict, <laughs> religion and genocide. <laughs> I've been at a few FCDO meetings. And it still isn't always there. I tell Sue every time it happens, and she says, <laughs> I know, Claire, I know. <laughs> um, uh, look at hate speech. And I know that the online harms bill is going through this parliament this week, but like legislating for hate speech is probably not the way forward in some of the contexts around the world that the FCDO is operational in. And you need to use other like positive messaging um, mechanisms. And the one last thing I will maybe say is that, um, and this is kind of very personal, <laughs> self-interested on my part, is that I do quite a lot of work, including through Creed, influencing the GSP plus process in Brussels, because the Pakistani authorities really listen when they are told that they may lead their, lose their trade benefits. They, they sit up, they notice, they do a few things, maybe not everything we'd like them to do, but they that they, they achieved some political change. And when the UK left the EU, we have, a, we have our own GSP plus process, but I still don't understand how civil society can get involved in that and whether it's fully functioning, there was a consultation out, I'm not sure where it's got to. We, we really need to keep our eyes on that and make sure that the UK's trade uh, influence over governments around human rights, around religious minorities is something that we, we continue to really make the most of.